Hello and welcome back to Learn Linux TV. In today's video, we're going to talk about group management. In a recent video that I did in this series, we covered user management. And most of the time, it really doesn't matter what order you watch these videos in in the series, but this is one of those exceptions where it's probably best if you've watched the previous video that's related before this one. So you might want to check out the user management video before you watch this video. I'll leave a card for that other video right about here. Now, before we get into the topic at hand and discuss group management, I want to mention the Patreon page for this channel because, you know what, I have a ton of fun creating content for you guys. I just love it, but it is time consuming and oftentimes expensive. So if you are able to help out and support this channel, please do. You can go on the official Patreon page for this channel and you could benefit from perks such as early access to select videos and even ad free content as well because going forward, I am actually uploading ad-free videos anytime I upload a YouTube video, so patrons are able to watch ad-free versions of the videos on this channel. That's just one of the many perks. And another perk is that you can get a live mention during one of my videos, and that's what Matthew Michael did. One of the perks for him was, well, a live mention. Hi, Matthew. I really appreciate it. So definitely check out my Patreon page. I would really appreciate that. And without any further ado, let's get into the topic of group management. So first of all, it's important to understand that every file is owned by a user and a group. And here we can see that I am the owner, my group and my user both are the owner for everything in my home directory. That makes sense. That's typical. It's my home directory. So of course I own everything inside it. So in this first column here, we can see the user that owns that particular object. And then we see the group that is assigned to that particular object. Now, if the output here looks a bit confusing, especially this section right here, then make sure you check out my video on permissions in Linux. I'll leave a card for that right about here. That'll explain what all of this means. But when it comes to our use case today, group management, we're going to omit most of this and just focus on the user and the group, especially the group because, well, this is a video on group management. That's what we're doing today. So as you can see here, every object is assigned to the J group. And groups are important when it comes to Linux administration because it helps you simplify Linux administration. I mean, just think about it. If you had a department that had 100 employees, would you want to go in and give each employee manually access to a particular file or folder? I didn't think so. It's usually better to assign all the employees to a particular group so that you could give them all access in one shot. And also things like SSH, which I'll show you later, will also benefit from this because you can actually control access to your server by utilizing groups as well. There's so many use cases for groups, I don't even think I'm going to go over all of them or even most of them in this video. Okay, so groups are important. We get it. But how do I know which groups in particular my user is a member of? And you know what? I'm glad you asked, because that brings us to the very first command that I'm going to show you in this video, which is simply groups. Easy to remember. I'm not going to add any options or arguments or anything like that. I'm just going to enter groups, as you see here. And what that does is it shows me which groups my user is a member of. Now, in a previous video, I showed you guys user management. And in that video, I created a secondary user that's going to be using my system. So what I can also do is type groups followed by a username. And what that allows me to do is find out what groups another user is a member of. So essentially, if you don't enter a username as an argument or option to the groups command, it's just going to show you what groups you are a member of. But I created Fox Mulder as a user on the system last time. And yes, I am including sci-fi references in tutorials that I'm doing right now. So that's completely intentional. And if you don't know what the heck I'm talking about, that was an X-Files reference. Anyway, we have the user Fox Mulder on our system. He's going to be using my system to do some important FBI work, specifically around aliens and things like that. But I want to know which groups he's a member of. 
and really only his own, as you can see here. And that makes sense because I didn't really add him to any groups. I wanted to save that for this video. I mean, what would be the point of me adding him to all the groups in the previous video? I wouldn't really have anything to talk about. So as you can see, I'm a member of quite a few groups, and he's only a member of one. Basically, his own group. Now, before we go any further, a quick aside. In the previous video, I went over the Etsy password file. And I'm not going to go over this file again in this video. In the user management video, I went over what all of this means. But the simple summary of what the Etsy password file does is it has a listing of all the user accounts on your system. And the reason why I bring this up in a group management video is because we have a very similar file for groups. And that file is Etsy group. It's very similar to the Etsy password file, but it's specific to groups instead of users. And as you can see, each of these lines here, they're not as long, so it's a simpler file as well. And just like with the Etsy password file, there are several columns in this file as well, and the columns are separated by a colon, like you see here. So what we can glean from that is this is a column, this is a column, and this is a column as well. We also have a column here at the end, but as you can see, there's nothing there. More on that later. Now the first column, as you see right here, right here, and so on, that is the name of the group. So this tells me that we have a group on the system called SSH. We also have a group on the system called J. We also have a group right here called Fox Molder. It's not always the case, but it's very common on quite a few distributions of Linux that when you create a user by default, that user will also get assigned to a group that is named after themselves. So that group will be created. Now, when I actually set up this distribution right here on my laptop, during the installation process, it asked me what I wanted my username to be. And when I told it that I wanted a username of J, it went ahead and created a group of J, this one right here, to go along with my username. And that's actually a primary group, which I'll be talking about here in a minute. But for now, just understand that the first column is the name of the group. Now the second column refers to the group password. And actually, I'm not going to be going over that. And no, I'm not going to tell you that group passwords are beyond the scope of this video. Technically, that's not beyond the scope of this video. But the reason why I'm not going to go over group passwords then is because, well, nobody uses them. And actually, nobody should use them. Reason being, there's a security risk associated with group passwords, so We'll just pretend that doesn't exist, but if you are curious what the second field here, which is an X in every case, what that refers to, that refers to group password, but we're going to skip that. The next field here is the group ID. In the previous video on user management, I went over the user ID or UID. Every user account on a Linux system has his or her own UID. And that's just like groups. Every group has its own GID. And just like with UIDs, each group has to have a unique GID. So my group right here has a GID of 1000. Now that GID cannot be used for another group. That's mine. Now I mentioned here that we have another column, but it's not set. We have this divider right here, the colon, and that divider is not actually marking the end of the line. It's instead marking the beginning of another column, but there's nothing there. Well, actually, if I scroll up, you will start to see something in that field, for example, right here, and there you see my name. So that last field actually shows you which users are a member of that group. So I am a member of this group. If a group doesn't even have any members, as most of these don't, you won't even see anything here at the end. So just understand that this last column will show you which users are a member of that particular group. So now you understand the Etsy group file. Okay, so... We know how to see which groups are on the system, and we even know how to tell which groups our own user and other users are a member of. So how do we create a group? For that, we actually have a dedicated command. So what I'm going to do is add a group right now. So right there, I added a new group, and I decided to call it Gamers. I mean, wouldn't it be so cool if your company had a gaming department? and you just had people there that were paid to play video games? Okay, well that's not all that realistic. That probably won't happen. So let me go ahead and delete that group. So already, 
we saw an example of creating a group and deleting a group. So here, actually for both of these, I used sudo. We don't actually need sudo privileges or root privileges to see which groups are on the system, nor do we need root privileges to see which groups a user is a member of, but we definitely need sudo or root privileges when we want to make changes to the system, and adding a group, well, that's definitely a change to the system. So here we use the group add command, and that's pretty self-explanatory. The group add command, well, adds groups. And then we type the name of the group that we want to add. Similarly, the group del command, or group delete command, allows us to remove a group. And in this case, I removed the gamers group. And that's the easiest part of this entire video. Adding groups and removing groups, that's simple. Group add or group del. That's all there is to it. But as with most things with Linux, there's always more to it than that. Let's dive a little bit deeper. First of all, it's important to understand that there are two different types of groups, primary groups and supplementary groups, aka secondary groups. If we check the Etsy password file, for example, and I'll go to my user account right here, we have the username, as I went over in the user management video, the UID is right here, but here we have the group ID, or GID. And this is how we tell what the primary group is for a user. It doesn't actually tell me what the group is, but it does give me the group ID for that group. So from this output, we know that my primary group is the group that is associated with group ID 1000. And there we go. My group, the group that's named after my user, is group ID 1000, and that makes sense. So that's how we tell what the primary group is for a user. But what's the difference between a primary group and a supplementary group? Actually nothing. If we check the entire contents of Etsy group, you won't see anywhere in here that designates any group as a primary group or a secondary group. Any of these groups can be a secondary group, and any of these groups can be a primary group. So there is no such thing as a primary group or secondary group as different types of groups. So a group is only a primary group if it's assigned to a user as a primary group. So it's all about how it's assigned, not how it's created. There's no separate group add command. There's no primary group add or anything like that. So basically, it's just about how groups are assigned. That makes all the difference. As far as how the primary group impacts you as the user, when you create files, the files will be created with the permissions that will include an ownership of your primary group. And processes that you spawn might have that as well. It's beyond the scope of this video. It's just important to understand that a user is assigned a primary group, and there could be one primary group, and then any number of supplementary groups that you want to assign, that's fine. So in my case, we have J as the primary group, and then we have these as the added extra supplementary groups. Okay, so how do we actually add a user to a group? Let's work on that right now. First of all, I'm going to add a group, and I'm going to name that group Linux Admins. In the SE group file, we can see that the Linux Admins group this one right here was added. It was given a GID of 1002, as you see here. So we were able to add that group. So now that we have that group, let's go ahead and assign a user to that group. Now there's more than one way that you could use to modify group membership. My preferred approach is to use the user mod command, this one right here. Now the user mod command is not actually specific to groups. As the name would imply, it allows you to modify user accounts. And modifying groups is just one of the many things that you can do with the user mod command. So if you want to use this particular command, the user mod command, to add a user to a group, then the options you want to give it is dash A, and dash A means append. You want to make changes to a user. And what you want to do is then use the dash capital G option for groups to add a user to a supplementary group. But actually, we can simplify this by combining the options together under one hyphen, so it ends up looking like that. So then you type the name of the group you want to add a user to, and the group that we created was Linux Admins. 
And then finally, the name of the user that you want to add to that group. And it's that simple. We can see now that Fox Mulder is a member of the Linux admins group. Now, if you wanted to change the primary group of a user, then you would actually adjust this command a little bit. And in that case, you wouldn't include the dash A, and you also wouldn't include dash uppercase G either, because dash lowercase G refers to the primary group. So in this case, if I was to run this command, I would be changing the primary group for the Fox Mulder user to be Linux admins. I'm not going to press enter. I don't recommend that you modify this either, because there's other things that you have to do after you modify a user's primary group that I'm not going to go over in this video. It's beyond the scope. And also changing a user's primary group is not something you'll commonly do anyway. I just want to at least make you aware of how you would do that if you did find a situation where you needed to do that. So at this point, the Fox Mulder user has membership to these groups, its own primary group and also Linux admins. If this user was logged in right now, they would not actually have access to Linux admins. What they would have to do is log out and log in in order to gain access to that group. So to illustrate that, what I'm going to do is modify my own user account. So I'm going to add myself to that group. But if I type groups, it doesn't show it. Now what's interesting, if I type groups and then J, which is actually a little weird because if you don't include a username here, then the groups command assumes that you want to know what groups your user is a member of. But like I mentioned earlier, you can add a username here if you want to check the group membership of another user. But I've added my own username right here, even though that's implied. But the output is different. It's just one of those curious things, right? So if you enter groups by itself, it's checking your logged in session, essentially. A little bit more complicated than that. That's the simplest way to think of it. But if you add a username to the end of the groups command as an option, what it's going to do is check the group memberships for that particular user, regardless of whether they're logged in or not. And that's why I'm able to see the Linux admins group membership right here. But if I wanted to actually utilize the Linux admins group, I need to log out and log in for this to take effect. Now I mentioned earlier that the user mod command is not the only command that you can use to modify group memberships. In fact, we have the gpasswd command, group password command, if you will, right here. And I'm sure quite a few of you guys were probably writing in the comments, why are you using user mod when you probably should be using gpasswd? And my answer to that is habit. User mod is a perfectly valid way of adding a user to a group. gpasswd is valid as well. It just depends on what you, as the administrator, prefer to use. And we'll need sudo to have the appropriate privileges to use a command like gpasswd. And what I'm going to do is show you the equivalent of the user mod command, but with a gpasswd command. And as you see here, we have the syntax. That's just an aside, I wanted you to be aware of the gpasswd command as well, and now you are. Now let's go ahead and see a more practical example of group management, a reason that you probably would want to use it for. Now you don't actually have to follow along with what I'm about to do. In fact, you probably shouldn't, unless you really do want to modify your OpenSSH server, but you might not even have OpenSSH installed anyway, so this isn't going to work for all of you. It's just an aside. As you probably already know, SSH is a very convenient way of accessing your servers remotely. I mean, it's certainly better nowadays to use SSH to manage your company's servers than to get in the car and drive all the way to the office. We could do whatever administration we want to do with SSH wherever we happen to be. But we also don't want to allow anyone to access SSH. That would be bad. So in my case, I'm going to edit the Etsy SSH sshd underscore config file. That's the config file for the SSH server. I'm going to scroll down. And this might already be in the file, but probably not. Again, don't follow along with me. It's just an example. I'm going to add a new option here. Allow users. And you might be wondering, what does this have to do with group management? We're getting to that. So 
So basically what I did was I added my username and then several sci-fi characters as you see here. Allow users, what that does, if you didn't already know, is that allows you to define which users in particular are allowed to access your server via SSH. If you include this option, and then you restart the OpenSSH server service, then only these users right here will have any ability to log into the server via SSH. Technically, this isn't the best way to do it. It is valid, and you actually will want to make sure that you limit the users that are able to access your server via SSH. But this is, well, a little bit of a pain to manage. I mean, just think about it. If you had 100 employees accessing the server, you'd have 100 names right here. And any time a user leaves a company or a new user is added, you'll have to modify this and restart the SSA service. So even though allow users is perfectly valid, it's not practical. So let's see a different example. You could change it to allow groups. And that's it. We can create the group SSH users. It doesn't exist just yet. This is just an example. Then after we create it, we can add users to that group. And that's how we can better control access to SSH. We only have to modify that one group. We don't have to edit a text file and then restart the service. We have only one step when it comes to adding or removing access to OpenSSH. That's a good idea. Now, what I'm going to do is exit out. I'm not going to save this. That was just a practical example of group management. One of many examples, actually, because group management and understanding group management is very important. Now, the last thing that I'll leave you with is how to remove a user from a group. So I'm going to add yet another group. I'll add test group. And I'm going to add Fox Mulder to that group. And nothing new there. But let's go ahead and see an example of how to remove that user from that group. So what we'll do is we'll run sudo and then gpasswd. We'll use the option dash D, and that doesn't refer to deleting the group. It's for removing a user from that group. And then we type the name of the user that we want to remove from a group. And the group in particular is going to be test group. Just like that. And it even says right there, removing user Fox Mulder from group test group. Couldn't be simpler. Be sure to check out the article on learnlinux.tv for this particular video. It's going to have all of these commands on there, so if you need to refer to any of these commands in the future, you can easily do that. So there you go. You now know how to manage groups on your Linux server. I showed you how to add and remove groups, how to add a user to a group, take a user away from a group. So we've done a lot today. And we're going to do even more because I have more episodes in this series coming and you'll see them very soon, so stay tuned. Anyway, as always, thanks for watching.